Fateh. Thank you to everyone who's uh, joined us uh, today for this discussion um, about the events of January 26th primarily um, and the conversation that's kind of been happening in a lot of circles um, and a lot of WhatsApp groups that I'm sure we're all a part of um, around, you know, um, how to interpret the events and, um, you know, currently what's happening. Um, I'd like to kind of begin um, by reading some points from a, a joint statement that has just been issued um, by individuals um, who themselves, they wouldn't call themselves leaders, um, but definitely a lot of people look towards them for leadership. Um, the statement's uh, been issued in Punjabi and it's been circulated mainly via WhatsApp um, uh, and uh, Six Yasset's um, news um, uh, website. I just read a couple of kind of key points from, from it. Um, and overall, the kind of statement it it, um, it gives a it gives direction in itself, and it talks about uh, you know what's been happening, and um, you know, and it talks about uh, how you know the events that have been taking place are part of the ups and downs of, of the struggle, um, and and how they're viewing what's happening. So um, it begins that uh, in the uh, in the wake of this struggle, um, sorry, actually it begins um, that farmers on the wings of the Delhi throne are fighting for the creation of a new farming model that is pro-nature and pro-farmer for the betterment of all. Before creating this new model, our main goal is the repeal of these um, three so-called pro-corporate agriculture laws passed by the Delhi Takat. Um, and in the wake of the struggle, it talks about the role of all parties concerned in the events that took place uh, in the uh, Ghassan parade on um, January 26. And it says that these events need to be carefully considered. Um, the first and foremost part, uh, part the, the first and foremost party is the common peasant and the people who are the backbone of this peasant struggle. It is the people who have brought this um, front to the forefront of Delhi, this Morja to the forefront of Delhi. The people have made every effort to follow their leaders announcements in their speeches uh, and in, in accordance with the blueprints raised by the lyricists and, and singers. Leaders may have backed out of their announcements and campaigns, but the people have not backed down. Um, and it goes on to say, at every important stage, whether it was November uh, the 26th or January the 26th, the people have shown discipline despite being lead leaderless and in the absence of leaders. The use of force was limited to removing roadblocks in spite of the clashes with the police. In many places, the people themselves rescued police personnel um, and, you know, we've all seen the, uh, the videos of uh, women um, police personnel being rescued by uh, Nihang Singhs. Um, and it goes on to say that on January 26, millions of people entered Delhi through the ring road and did not harm any person or any private property or any public property. They didn't disrespect anyone. And they represented the sentiments evoked by the leaders and the songs at the Red Fort. The people themselves returned to their stages outside Delhi without the presence of a responsible leader. However, if the farmers parade did not go smoothly and the farmers involved in the parade had to go hungry and thirsty day and night in the cold, the Dili Takat is the main uh, responsible party for this. And it is the government that's constantly dragging the issue um, towards no solution. And it goes on to criticize the, uh, the inaction of the government saying that the government either itself is incapable of making a decision and is suffering from paralysis or the government is um, uh, uh, is um, is directly contributing to the, uh, to the failure. But in either case, the government itself is um, directly responsible. And and it, when it comes on to the issue of the the root, it says the government is creating the situation of anger amongst the peaceful and patient people. And even before the the twenty sixth of January, it became clear the people were not ready to accept the route given for the farmers' parade. The government didn't approve the parade um, on the ring road and did not offer any other respectable alternative. So either, the, uh, and it, again, you know, the, the point that either the government is deliberately allowing this to happen or they're suffering from paralysis. Uh, and secondly, the San Yukt Kasan Murja has failed miserably to understand the sentiments of the people that led to the people, um, that led the people um, during this Dili Jalo program. And the people themselves are the, representing this idea of Dili Jalo in, in the truest sense. Um, and it, it talks about the regular atmosphere that, um, of the speeches and the messages about going Dili, um, even before uh, 26th of January, that the organizers, the leaders um, uh, um, were creating. Um, and I think we'll kind of um, leave it there. And actually, uh, there's one more important point to talk about. 
Um, it says about 200 youths have been arrested by Delhi police in connection with um, the, uh, one of the incidents. Um, uh, an I ITO, um, a young man, has also died um, on the side of the road. And the governments um, are providing um, basic legal assistance to those arrested. But it's unfortunate the leaders of the Kasan uh, Morcha have turned their back on the arrested youth. Every sympathizer of the peasant struggle and every supporter of the truth should take the essence of these youth and protest strongly against the action being taken against them. Ups and downs are part of the struggle. This struggle is related to the issue of the welfare of mankind as evidenced by um, uh, as evidenced uh, by the clear public participation and support. The need now is to learn from the past and bring the struggle back on track. In view of the oppressive and deadly approach being taken by many sections of the leadership, all the sympathizers and sympathizers of the struggle outside of um, the Kasan Morcha should play an active role in bringing this movement on, on strong footing going forward. Um, it's a very powerful statement. I'll, I'll provide a link to it um, to the participants later on as well. It's a really important statement that, that should be read and considered. Um, and it kind of uh, uh, gives us a, a, um, a good starting point to our conversation. Um, and if we, were, if we were to talk about what this clash is that's taking place, um, you know, Manin Singh, you know, earlier we were talking um, and you, you're talking about um, the, the clash and how you see it is one of Taram and Sedant versus worldly politics. Um, could we begin at, at that point? Yeah, definitely. Um, first of all, to, to everyone that's uh, listening in. Um, I think some of the things we're going to say today are going to be like um, extremely straightforward. I think they need to be straightforward. They probably needed to be straightforward for a number of months now. And Many of us under this uh, idea of ekta, which I want to get into in a second here, uh, that falls under this nazaria or perception of how uh, we're supposed to be seeing this fight. Because what the question we start off with is that, well, how do we see this? Like, how should we view this? And, and the answer to that is, is that it depends on who you are. And it depends on where your allegiance is. And it depends on like what your uh, allegiance brings about in that perception. So what, what I want to talk about is that just right now, uh, a few, I believe not, not, not more than a few minutes, maybe an hour or two ago, there's a video that's circulating of a tamki that's been given at single border right now uh, by the RSS, uh, that the RSS has made it known uh, or people claiming to represent the RSS. And it could go a number of different ways, but let's just take it for what the, 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 the Kassans and the Khalsa on the ground right now, what their response is. And then we'll see as in like how this uh, this raises emotions within us. But I'm about to say something. Uh, a Nahang uh, Seng uh, at the Singhu border uh, just put out, there was a video of him that was put out right now, uh, an elderly Bajorg Nahang Seng. Uh, and he made it clear that somebody that was claiming to be from the RSS said that the Singhu border must be uh, cleared out by 12 o'clock. Uh, and if it's not cleared out by 12 o'clock, uh, 200,000 members of the RSS or their like Sangh Parivar, that right wing uh, kind of like fascist type uh, Hindutva, Brahman, Soch, those individuals will come and they'll clear it themselves. Now, th this Bajorg's response to this was that uh, See, now that immediately, it will do two things. Those that are connected to Gursadant, those that are going to be aligned with the uh, Sikhi as their Murdla Nata, will see that as a very unkey response, right? It's, a, it's what we expect from our Bajorg, so it's what we ex expect from the Khalsa, what we all expect from the Hang Singhs, especially because they are the world done there. So we expect that. But on the other side, there's this other segment of people that are involved in this Morcha that will be like, Right, so like we're asking for violence. I see we're not asking for anything, we're responding. If we had said, Come here, we're going to do this to you, or we're going to do this to you, or we're going to do this to you, it would have been different. But there's a chanoti given out, there's a warning, uh, there's a threat given out to us, and the response is, right? as in, but just be prepared when you come. That we'll see you when you get here. That is the entire, like in my mind, when you look at the entire morcha that started, uh, this idea has always been there. There's, there's, a, there's a, like, a, I've been using this kind of quote recently because it's been making more and more sense to me uh, from uh, Sanapati, who was a, a poet, uh, one of the poets of Guru Gobind Singh. And he said, Ek or peo khalsa, ek or sansar. 
that on one side of the world, you have the Khalsa and their ideals and their values and the way they're set up and their mission that's given by the Guru. And on the other side is the entire world. It doesn't mean we're better. It doesn't mean we're like above them or anything like that. It just means we're different. And it's always going to be a takra. Why? Because tarum jadaya, it influ- not only influences, it relegates our uh, siyasat at the end of the day. Tarum is what kind of keeps us grounded. So whatever our grounding is in this morcha, it's connected to tarum. Uh, for those of us that are coming from a Bantak perspective, the clash right now, the clash is of ideas. We're so ingrained within tarum that we expect that those that are pretty much in many ways, and people can take offense to this, they're at tarmi at the end of the day that they're going to understand what we're trying to say. Yet these so-called atarmis, like these Ghassan Union leadership, the vast majority of them, there's no denying it now, it's all in front of us. Step, every step of the way, they've tried to remove the idea of Dharam and Sikhi from this entire Sangaj. That's the clash. If you look at it, what's our, what's our internal fight right now? The internal fight has Lagatar been the Pant versus this Ghassan leadership. The Kazan leadership is Nishan Sahib Nichalone, Khalse De Bol Bale, Raj Grega Khalsa Nikana, Nahang Sang Pajan should go home. We don't need them here. It's this removal, this erasure of Sikhi from this entire movement. That's the fight. The clash has been that a clash of ideas. So even when we look at it, this idea of Ekta, right? So uh, when we look at the, the Ekta idea, the Ekta idea has consistently been from the Kazan unions do what we say um, or get out. It's, the ekta isn't that there's space for everyone's chanda there. The ekta isn't that Saryan de Bol Wale Chaluge, Saryan de Ete, Vaikurji ka Khalsa, Vaikurji ki Fateh ta ke, they were uh, pitti jande se, ke, ke, this shouldn't be said from the stage. Yet every musician that got on stage, every average banda that got on stage, from Lakha Sadana to Deep Siddhu to anyone else, everyone started with Vaikurji ka Khalsa, Vaikurji ki Fateh. This is just ingrained in individuals. Jado morcha shuru hunda, this is what starts it. Vahiguru starts it, Akal Prak starts it. Then if you look at what, they, what they've done is they've also created a secondary narrative that goes in with it. This perception, this idea of how, what our outlook is and how it's being abused in, in a way as well. They've stated more, more, more that if something goes wrong, if there's bloodshed, like it's on the head of Deep Sudhu. If there's bloodshed, it's on the head of La Kasadana. And they're picking at people that are more, let's say, Pant oriented. Like they themselves don't represent the Pant, but so they're speaking from a sick perspective. So they're attacking them. They're making them the scapegoats here. And they more and more say that if there's bloodshed, now you're taking the entire responsibility of state-led and organized violence off the state's head and you're placing it on our own. You're taking those people that are being beaten, murdered in the streets, uh, lying in the streets in the cold for like to what, uh, almost uh, you know, 60, 70 days now. 200 plus people that have died on the streets and you're taking the entire responsibility as a so-called leadership of this morcha and you're placing it on the heads of the people or those that represent the people and you're completely absolving the state from any responsibility. It's these types of things that I think are problematic in this entire morcha. We're getting to it now because now the clash is just like now it's like this. Before it's kind of like we were doing this and you, nobody really wanted to engage. Like as in like, let's keep this so-called ekta. But that ekta has never been true ekta. Because how can we as Sikhs, and if our outlook on this morcha is completely Sikh-oriented, how can we actually have Ekta with this type, these types of people? They're not being sincere. Uh, and as we get further into the issue of like the Nishan Sabah, the Lal Kila and other things, uh, it'll be very apparent there. But like this, this clash, and I'll end it with this on this point, this clash of ideology is so ingrained in the idea that we can't look at anything except from a sick perception. If we look at it from anything beyond a sick perception, as if it's dunyavi one again. And in, in dunyavi sense, like, uh, like we were talking earlier as well, in the dunyavi sense, it's other things that lead us to make decisions. So there's like things like fa and fall, which is fear and doubt. There's maya around us. Everything that we see seems like a reality. But you know from a Sikh perspective, and if you call and declare yourself a Sikh, or you align yourself with the Sikh identity, the onus is on you to understand what the Sikh perception is. Whether you do that through Sangat in forums like this, or in your local Gurdwari, or people around you, or you do it through reading and narrative and understanding, we do it through Gurbani, we do Koj and research. All of those are mechanisms for you to develop a Sikh Hazariya. And it's not uh, enough to be able to say, I didn't know. Because if you didn't know, then you shouldn't say anything. 
Like th th this is the thing that most people don't get that everyone wants to be in that role right now as in like, I want to say something, I want to post something and you're do and most are doing it from a very emotional lens and emotion, you can't take it out of these things, but emotion can't be the only thing that kind of takes us to a point of our narrative. The narrative is in Gurbani, Gurudehas, Gurmat, or Rani Bani, or Bol Bale, or Nishan Sahib, or Bana. Everything is our narrative. I see Jiyunde Jagde, we're a walking narrative, is how we kind of express ourselves. So when you limit that narrative to things like that the Guru has warned us, that this whole world, right? Like if you think about it, like and somebody gave me this example that everything that's been given to you or you've accomplished in life. It's supposed to be a sadhan for the fund. It's supposed to be a resource for the fund. The dunyavi padai or the worldly education is supposed to be a weapon the fund can use in that madan, uh, whether it's academia or whatever it is. Your uh, jivani and your like josh is supposed to be at the disposal of the fund. Yeah, your gurbani and your gurmat and your rat is supposed to be what grounds you to make sure to see the as you move forward in this any sankarsh that you do on behalf of the fund. All of those things are supposed to be characterizing you as an individual. And all of those things are supposed to lead to your perception of the dunya, which is a sopana, it's a dream. This isn't the reality. So if all of that is true, and all of that is what kind of is given to us as a sadhan for the panth, then what are we afraid of losing when it comes to sacrificing for the panth? And uh, this, this, a key, this point here at the end, and we'll move on, I guess. Uh, but like the idea that we will be able to accomplish something so great uh, without actually sacrificing anything from a Tanuman or a Tan perspective is alien to us. That doesn't, that doesn't even come up uh, for us as six. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll end it there, but as in like a week, we, can't, we are trying to achieve things by reading into narratives that are being set by uh, individuals that are on the ground there that are not actually there to promote Sikh ideals or perception or Nazaria. They're actually there to erase it. So we can't get caught up in that type of fight. Yeah, that, that's super powerful. And, you know, it's, you know, one thing that you said, right, like this uh, is a form of Sangat, you know, and, it, and you know, how this, the, how central Sikhi is to everything. You know, if, if this COVID thing was happening, you know, so many of these conversations and these discussions would be taking place in the Gurdwara. Um, and that Sangat would be so important to everything, um, to everyone, bringing everyone together. So instead of us kind of having this, um, you know, like this super kind of analytical, framework where we're looking at everything through profit and loss, where we're looking at everything through the lens of we have to remain peaceful and and Sikhi just kind of becomes like almost like a addressing or a or, you know on top of everything um that that's like super problematic and and from the start right you know are, are the conversations that we've done before with yourself and you know with loads of other people as well the it's been very clear that what brought people to the um you know um this to to Delhi has been Sikhi you know, one of the famous, uh, you know, things, um, you know, I think Deep Siddhu said it as well, right? Like it wasn't Karl Marx that brought people here. It was Guru Nanak, right? They, they're not aware of, um, you know, Karl Marx's philosophy, but they definitely know Guru Nanak's philosophy. Um, and even now today, the scenes that we're seeing from uh, Ghazipur border in particular, where the police have issued like a blanket announcement that we're going to forcibly remove everyone. One of the videos I was just watching before this call is like an elder Sikh sitting there, everyone sitting in Sangat and they're doing Satanam Wahiguru and the reporters asking, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And the, the guy's just doing Satanam Wahiguru and saying, we're not going anywhere. And this is why we came and it is Shaheed Deepani Bogi, we could become martyrs sitting here, but we're, we're not going to go anywhere. So it's uh, it's really clear from, from what people have been saying continuously that Sikhi is what's driving them and motivating them, but that isn't finding any space within the kind of political discourse, let's call it, the worldly political discourse. Um, I've got a question actually before we move on, and I think it's quite uh, an, an interesting one. What happens when people read the same thing but get something different out of it because of their politics, i.e. how people read Gurbani and still translate it in a way that is rooted in the understanding of internalized uh, coloniality, but assert that they are actually seeing it from a Sikh perspective? I think we're going to touch on this later as well, but if you want to say anything, um, you know, it would be, be cool if you could comment on that right now as well. Uh, there, there's a difference between uh, understanding um, and like uh, when you have the weaknesses, like as in the, we all do, uh, I have them as well. Sometimes we take Karwani as we make it fit uh, what we need it to fit. Like I'll give you an idea, like 
uh, you know, Sarvata Pala. Like, even if we take Garwani uh, uh, just aside for a second, but if you take all of our bol bale, uh, Sarvata Pala, and we'll take that as in like, oh, that means pretty much like as in like, uh, you know, we just give langar to everyone and we just do this and we just do that. We do a very basic type of like dunyavi, worldly type things. And ma- mainly in the Western world, we do it mainly from a model, model minority perspective. Um, that that that's kind of like very clear, but like from a Gurbani, the, the, you, you're still a Dura at the end of the day. We all are. We're, our our samaj of Gurbani is never complete. It's an ongoing cycle of just understanding, koj and, and learning. But when we take specific pankhtiyan uh, and take them out of context, that's just a sign of our own weakness. And and the question of being around like what happens, it just means uh, like as in like you're just it, not only are you uh, like fooling yourself. Um, but you're like Adura in the side, eyes of the Guru as well. Like if you're going to use Gurbani and take it to, um, like a, we always say this idea of like, as in like, and that we try to kind of veil our own weaknesses in, in a way where it doesn't, it's not me that's weak, that the Panth shouldn't do this. So uh, case in point being like in the last uh, two or three years, there's been, well, I guess about four or five years now, there was a rash of like over a period of about 18 months, multiple right-wing RSS leaders were assassinated in Punjab. And you had the world, like of six in the world, just kind of like, oh my God, this is horrible. Um, and it was really odd in some sense because it's like, well, we're peace-loving people in the West, right? Like, how do we justify this then? How does the model minority syndrome, like as in like, how is it going to be affected by the Jangi Khalsa that's on the ground in Punjab doing its, playing its role? So it's like, it's hard for us to kind of like define it because we are losing something here because these white people that we're trying to like suck up to out here, all of a sudden it's just like, well, what do you think of this? And then how hard is it to say, uh, well, um, you know, it's political. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with it. And people start making excuses for it. So I, I don't believe that as in like, uh, you know, six right now, especially in the West um, and on the ground, you can say there's like this physical violence that they're afraid of as well. But in the West, it's just this idea of like living up to, and I think uh, part of the question had the, the idea of like coloniality and like, how, how that influences them. I think it's very deep. It's very deeply entrenched um, uh, within us. And that kind of like, that leads to that weakness. That that breeds that weakness, why we would interpret Qurbani for anything than it actually is. That actually like taking it, thwarting it, marauding it to fit our personal needs. There's nothing worse than that. Uh, and even like, you know, we, we use the idea of Ram Rai changing a word, right? Uh, he changed one shabd, uh, one word uh, within Gurbani and the saza he got for that from uh, Guru Harai Sahib. Uh, but then what happens to us if we do the exact same thing where we take, not even changing a word, we're taking the actual shabd and we're actually, you know, thwarting it and marauding it to fit and cover our own weaknesses and kumjoriya. Then sanu kedi saza milugi yodhe legaan jake. And that's the thing is that we lose sight when I made that comment before, we lose sight that this world and this dunya and our jivan here in this state is temporary. And if that is lost on you, then you know, but there that can actually talk the talk and then go walk the walk. I may not be one of those individuals, but there's plenty of them around us. It's just that our own weaknesses still limit us from actually accepting them. Those bandi things that are in jail right now, those that shahids that came before us. Um, those are the ones that as in, we should be looking up to. But right now, like as in, uh, in a, maybe I went to, kind of off on a tangent on this question as well, but there's a lot that's piled into that question from that coloniality and colonialism perspective, but also from an internal perception of Sikhi of looking at yourself and what is your Nazaria living in the West? Um, and uh, I, I just want to kind of make this point because me and you talked about it and now seems like a good time to say it, that we're spending all of our time and energy in these Western diaspora countries trying to fit in. Um, we're just trying to fit in because in our minds, this is our future. These countries are our future. Living and existing here is our future. And, uh, you know, we talked about this and you brought it up specifically that, uh, you know, that when you walk this path as a Sangharist, uh, our Jajarus and our, our those that were like in the Kal Sapan said something very differently. And Jahadar Tulwinder uh, Singh Baba used to say in his Ardas that, Jede irate torpende ya Sangharshte irate hote. That essentially all of these governments, that when you start walking this path of the Sangharish, you start interacting with all these Dunyavi structures and state structures and nation states and all these types of things, you start figuring out very quickly that none of them are different. Canada and the UK and America uh, and their policies against what their economic interests are in the world 
uh, align very well with India and their intelligence and their caution of dissent. And they all start meshing together like this. So no one is truly ours. Uh, we're a benefit to India when they need us on like borders to fight their wars. We're a benefit to these countries in like Canada where they need 20 or 30 seats from a political minority like us in their political like gains. So there's a benefit that you provide to them in somewhat way. But the moment to see Jangi that you start talking about your own sovereignty, you start talking about Khalistan, you start talking about Khal Saraj, in every government in the world, you become an extremist or a terrorist. So the, there's, there's that idea as to the place you're trying to fit in so hard. Just to remember of uh, this much that as in, just think of what you have to dilute and compromise within yourself and your Sikhi to actually fit in. And in this temporary world, is it really going to be worth it? And then, it's, then we'll all realize that it wasn't worth it. Yeah, for sure. And, and I know we talk about this as well, right? Like how um, people, you know, especially the Ramrai example, it, one word was changed to appease those in power and that was completely unacceptable to the Pant. But today, in today's day and age, like the whole idea of Sarvat Dabala, um, it's become stripped of any challenge to power structure. It's just become, um, you know, something that's completely apolitical and a simple form of charity with, with nothing deeper behind it. And, and it's, it's, we, we lose um, so much in, in that process. I think that kind of brings us neatly onto um, the next part, which was the, the action that took place on January 26th, which is even in Sikh circles, um, and we have to accept this, even within Amritari Sikh circles that are supposed to view this um, in the way that you're talking about, perhaps, right? Um, even within those circles, people have been saying that what happened um, was a nuksan, it was damage, it shouldn't have happened, um, that, you know, and then taking that action and then kind of, you know, feeding into the rhetoric that, um, you know, some of the union leaders are putting out that this was a betrayal of, um, you know, the people, it was a betrayal of the struggle. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the Nishan Saib, essentially, the Nishan Saib shouldn't have gone up on, um, you know, the Lal Killer. And when they're viewing it, um, you know, the Indian media narrative has been very clear that either it is a Khalistani flag, um, or it's a secular religious flag that actually doesn't threaten the Taranga in any way. It exists underneath the Taranga because that's been, um, we have to accept that. That was all of the kind of rhetoric from the Indian media that the Taranga was higher, the Nishan Saib was lower, the Nishan Saib is also in the Gurdwara, the Nishan Saib is also with um, Sikh soldiers in the Indian army, the Nishan Saib is also when Modi goes to the Gurdwara, he wears a ramal on his head, here's a picture of him with a, with a kanda on his head. So there the Nishan Saib represents and in fact celebrates Indian nationalism, it celebrates that we're very very good Sikhs and we're not a threat to the Taranga, the Taranga is our national identity and that's how the Indian media is viewing it, right? Um, and Sikhs are kind of viewing it through the lens of either we gained something, either took it properly in clear, that there was something gained here, or the in nuksan hoya. I'm sure no Sikh, um, you know, even the ones that are viewing this as nuksan, they're not. They no Sikh would accept the definition that the Taranga um, of the Nishan Saib that has been put out in the Indian media. Even though, actually, I want like, would like to add, inadvertently, a lot of Sikhs have normalized and accepted that discourse um, because they're like it wasn't a threat. Um, so, but no Sikh would actually accept, you know, um, that Nishan Saib doesn't represent what it represents for us. Uh, we don't need to go into that. But yeah, would you like to comment on this Barapti uh, versus Nuksan lens that uh, a lot of Sikhs are viewing this conversation at through? Yeah, I think the events are very clear to people. Like they saw what happened, but uh, I think uh, there are uh, a lot of people in the diaspora uh, amongst the Najwans that maybe don't know the faces of the individuals as well. Like they don't know who Rajawal is. They don't know who Ugraha is. They don't know who Rajinder Kamrad is. They don't, they, they don't follow, or they traditionally haven't followed these individuals in Pantak and Punjab politics, right? So when these people came forward, uh, this was the leadership. And we see it as an, in a uh, leadership in a very structural way, right? Like we, we, we've had this conversation that uh, these unions are set up in these structures where there's a hierarchy and these people have like political like, uh, like mileage. Uh, they have like these cadres of like people underneath them that, that they, these workers that they have. So they have a very like organizational systematic structure about them. Um, and that's when they came forward, we also, when we live out here, we see that organizational structure. We're like, okay, that guy right there is the leader. Um, and he's the one on stage. And, you know, then you get into the space. I think mean, we should blind, people are like, we should blindly follow 
what they're saying and use whatever they're saying as like ultimate truth. So I, I wanted to kind of like touch on like just a few points that people may have missed um, as this thing moved towards the 26th in just like a couple of minutes. Uh, the first thing that everyone should realize is, is that like the question before us is who called uh, the 26th protest? Uh, who said that there would be a tractor march? Who said And who said where it would be as well? If you go back a couple of weeks and you start watching how this whole thing transpired, there's at least six or seven different speeches that are being circulated from the Kassan union leadership, various uh, Kassan unions that are there. All, all the leadership was saying was that the, the march is going to be on the ring road, the road that kind of like circles Delhi. They had the speeches were so, let's say, jajbati or emotional at the end of the day. You had people on their stages, their leadership saying that as he go Modi de hekte, as he go darakana, pretty much we're gonna like dub uh, Modi down, or we're gonna like do this to him, or we're gonna do that to him. And you have these Naujuans listening. You're making appeals all the way to Punjab for people from Punjab to come bring their tractors, come to Delhi as Yakarnaya. Hundreds of thousands of people start marching towards Delhi. Thousands and tens of thousands of tractors start rolling in. And now you have everything lined up. And a few days before that, you bow down to what the state and the police is saying and say, well, no, we're not going to go on Ring Road anymore because the state doesn't want us to. We're going to go in the opposite direction. So they're going like 40 kilometers outside of Delhi uh, to, for, for their marches. And what's the, when the people there, not me who's sitting out here in the West, but the people, and we saw this, are asking, why are we even come? If, if you're going to give us a program, and then you're going to tell us to come. And then we spend all this money, time, energy getting here and leaving our families behind. And now you're telling us that we're just going to go back in the opposite direction. Then why do we even come? We could have taken our tractor marches in Punjab for that. Like, well, what's the benefit of this? The idea of a protest is not to follow the state and the police and what they tell you. We'll, we'll protest as left. If the state is and the police is going to tell you, you can stand there. You can say these things. You have this much time. And after that, you got to pack up and leave. Then all the protests are there. That's just that the salli upon yourself to be able to say that we did something, give yourself a tapi and be like, okay, let's go now. And that, that's not a true protest. So we, we first have to do that is that we have to actually call that out. Why is it that uh, that conversation is not happening? So right before uh, uh, the night of the 26th, everyone saw what happened on the stage. People, the Nojuans took over the stage, the main stage. They started talking, they collectively, not one individual, and I'm not even gonna name this individual until we get into it a bit, bit later because it's not worth it. There's no, there's no reason. Talk about the narrative and the action. Banda Dolzendaya, but talk about Jiri Soch, right? And uh, after that, in the name of that Soch, Jiri Karna Me Hunde, the actions that happen in the name of the narrative. Let's talk about that. So what happened was the Nojuans collectively decided we're going on the 26th. At the beginning of this conversation, you played uh, a tardivar, right? In that tardivar, the initial idea is Ardas ki on Picheni Hatana. That's it, right? So how many tens of thousands of Sikhs on the ground there must have done Ardas along the way, weeks in advance, ke Maharaj hun like Laj Rakhli, uh, like as in Asi Dili Jana Ya Fateh Karni, like as in like whatever they're going to do, that Laj Rakhli like Sanu Dolan or nothing. And then why would you think that those Sikhs from a Sikh perspective, I'm not talking about the F the world at the end of the day. From a Sikh perspective, how are they supposed to move more from the Guru now because Rajewal said so, or Ogaraha said so, or because there's a chance of danger or clash? Then why do you celebrate a Kalikula Singh then? Like why do you celebrate both us and Garja Singh then? In our entire history, and I'm about to get into this point from a loss benefit perspective, but like why don't we question the Kasan Union leadership that abandoned the people in that moment? They had every opportunity when the Naujuans made the decision, because this is the other thing you have to kind of look at in this point, is that on November 26, when they made the march towards Delhi, the Kassan Union leadership has consistently failed the people or failed to understand what the Pavnama or the emotions of the people are here. And every single time they make a decision, they have to go back on it because the people's will forces them to go back. Not because they want to themselves, it's because the people force them to go back. When they were supposed to come to Punjab, the union leadership's uh, call was, wherever they stop you, sit down. We're not going to clash with them. The Naujuan said no. They took their tractors, they rammed through the barricades. We celebrated that. Everyone in the West, everyone on the ground, everyone was like, this is amazing. Look at what the people are doing, right? But the Kassan leadership said, don't do it. You have to remember these things as we go forward. All the way through uh, when they're having these conversations with uh, the Modi Sirkar, this, that, and the other. When they went inside the very first time, 
people got on them about why are you eating their food? The most basic thing of why are you eating their food? They started taking their own longer. Why? Not because they wanted to, because the people made them. These types of decisions all the way up until January 26th. The people said no. If hundreds of thousands of people went and marched into Delhi and you had five to 10,000 people that were left on the tractor march, then who has the power? It's obviously not the Kassan leadership. And th that's something that we have to accept. If hundreds of, and those hundreds of thousands of people aren't stupid, and one person or two people aren't controlling them. They've collectively just started coming together to make those decisions. So they went into Delhi. And then let's just take a look at what happened uh, when they went in. They went into Delhi and there's questions that come up from them going into Delhi. And let, let's just address, address those as we go. What did we benefit is the biggest one. Like, and it's like, well, then you have to go back to the benefit. Like, what, what is, what is uh, your shada? What is your nuksan? What, what's your benefit? What's your loss here? So let, let's just talk about that. The idea of loss benefit from a Sikh lens is very different from a worldly lens. If we started looking at the entire Sikh history from a worldly lens, our entire history, all of it is a loss. Guru Arjan Shahidi, Guru Tegh Bahadur Shahidi, Shote Sahib Jade, Banda Singh Bahadur, like Pai Mani Singh, Taru Singh, Baba Deep Singh, Pai Gurwak Singh Shahid. You just keep coming all the way up into the present day. Everything is a nuksan. We'll see it as a loss. Because why? Because the dunyavi sense of loss is your loss of life, your loss of personal, like, uh, you know, we'll call it like uh, wealth and all these types of things. Anything that's connected to Maya at the end of the day is a dunyavi loss. And for a Sikh, it's like, Asita Tanuman Arpi, like as in Sabkuch Arpi, like we, we've given everything over to the fund. So you can't look at it out of the same lens. So for us to look at Delhi and what happened on January 26th, is that you have to look at it through, from a sick lens. And if you look at it through a sick lens, we will see that as in like, well, what we did there was a display or chalak of our anarchy existence. Like our self-worth, confidence, our power was on display that day. And we did it in a way, like you said before, we didn't damage people's property. We didn't kill anyone. We didn't clash with people, our average people. Uh, people went, they went there, they let out a case of Dina Shan and they left, right? So in that, what's the problem like who's seeing this as a problem this was an opportunity then for those that are not just ignorant but they actually exist to ta'ala sikhi they're just wanting to deliberately deliberately be able to attack six and sikhi in some way uh this gave them an opportunity to be like benefit you know and if you ask the same question to them that for two months you've been sitting on the streets of delhi 200 people have become shaheed there what did you gain? You lost 200 lives on that uh, in those two months. One person died on January 26th. One was injured uh, with gunshot wounds. So you're going to compare that one day when Kesri and Shan Sahib are let out to two months of your poor leadership and understanding of what this Sangarsh actually is. And you're trying to say that as in like, there's no benefit to this. Well, your benefit, there's no benefit over there either. If you're going to look at it that way, from a dunyavi sense, there's no benefit in what you've done yet either. But if you look at what could have happened, the Kassan leadership could have gone with the Naujuans. There's moments within the Sangarsh, like you look at these types of Morche, they start going like this and then they start fizzling out and then they start coming down because either the state waits you out um, to a point where people start getting my UCS and this is taking too long. How long can you actually sit on the streets of Delhi? Two months, four months, six months, maybe a year. But eventually the state may be able to wait you out. So this was a, a very good way for people to re-establish that josh they have in the Sangaj. And the Kassan Union leadership failed to see that as well. If they would have led them into Delhi, they would have led them into the Lal Qila, they would have actually put the uh, Nishan sides up and they would have left. Um, they would have had this power behind them, this josh behind them. Even the state would have seen that in their negotiations. In negotiations, whether it's on independence or sovereignty or any of these types of things, many things happen to keep both sides even. If you see yourself kind of slipping and the state has more power than you, you start doing actions on the side, whatever those actions might be, to bring yourself up to we're equals in this. You can't just push us away or you can't just like deliberately kind of push us aside. And if we look at uh, the Morcha in a different way, like, a, like a, I'm just going to bring this and then I'll, I'll, I know there's questions coming up and all these things, but uh, I do want to say this. If you look at this, <clears throat> uh, there was a question that came to me um, a few days ago, just on the, right after this happened, that they're just going to take the flag down anyways, right? That uh, you put the flag up, you can't compare this to Begail saying, and you can't do this, that, and the other. Well, don't compare it to Begail saying then. But 
do we actually think that when Bagheel Singh did Delhi Fateh and he left, that the Nishan Sahib stayed up? Or do we actually recognize the fact that the Mughals there, or the authorities there would have just waited a couple of days and taken it down anyways? Nothing's permanent. But the example Bagheel Singh sent is permanent in our Sakya, in our Atihas for our future generations. This right now is like a crucial moment for us to actually, how we actually view this moment for ourselves. If we look at um, Botas and Gajas thing, <clears throat> that was temporary as well. They did a morcha for a few days, they became shaheed for it, but it became generational, their, 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 their example. And that's what our entire history is. It wasn't for the, necessarily just the Dunyavi jet in the moment, it was a Siddhantak jet that would echo through eternity for Sikh and the Khalsa Pan, for us to be able to rely on those types of Siddhantak victories and then raise our children and our coming generations to live up to those standards again. If we look at what happened on the 26th, this is another example. It's like temporary. And these are the type of guerrilla tactics that you use when you're in these types of situations. You go in, you do as much damage as you can in a short amount of time as possible, and then you leave. And we did that with the Afghans when we raided their caravans. Uh, we, free, we freed slaves that they were taking away. We robbed their like the uh, treasuries that they were robbing people of. And we distributed wealth and we took people back to the homes that they were stolen from. So it's like that wasn't permanent either. It was all temporary. It was all like a tactic to be able to establish your jor and gain your strength and then go and face off with the enemy head to head in a future time. And we need to be able to look at these situations. This is a war that we're in. It's a jung at the end of the day. It's not just a morcha. This is a clash of like ideologies that's going on uh, at, a, at a state and Punjab level. And then internally we have our, our own bickering going on as well. But uh, I'll end it on this point. These three bills could be repealed, right? And a dunyavi jit could be gained. But if we don't have uh, our anak uh, gam in this morcha and our sedant is lost in this morcha, we may not find ourselves for a hundred years or ever again after this. And, and that's the fear that we should have in our mind. It shouldn't be whether these bills are necessarily repealed or not. We face way worse oppression than this uh, uh, in Punjab. So the idea can't be that the three bills are repealed and all of our Anak and Sadant, as we'll never find ourselves. We'll be lost as a calm uh, after that again. And on the flip side, if you take it the other way, these three bills could stay put. Our situation in poverty, destitution, oppression can continue. But if our Anak and Sadant, both of them stay cam in this entire process, future generations will have something to fight for. They understand how a Sikh Vijayi Nazariya and its, uh, its fighting ability and where they actually engage and how they engage, it all stays gam. Our Siddhant that started 300 years ago, if Baba Vanda Singh Bahadur watched 100 Sangs die every single day right in front of him up until the point of his child being killed in his lap, and O Siddhant Gam Rakhan Deveche, like as in like we didn't have a problem, then these are moments in this Sangat right now where we have to see these as examples or chalaks of that same Itihas, that same Siddhant that we're, we're trying to keep. So this Duniyavi Ladai versus the Siddhantik Ladai, the Siddhantik Ladai is what we should be more interested in. That has to be a front and center for us, not necessarily whether or not just these three bills are repealed, because once they get repealed, and as you know, then you know, then you know, then you know, and as in like, you know, this comment that I made several times before as well, it's like either we have to pick something, either we have to be at odds with the Indian state, or we're going to have to be at odds with the Guru's philosophy. And I, for one, can't fathom how if we describe ourselves or identify as six, how we would ever go on the Dunyavi Indian state side and be fearful and doubtful of what they're trying to do and then move more from our Guru. So, JSE Sikharana, the Sikhada Jada Peshaniya, Sadio Kamrakhani. Then we have to align ourselves always with the Guru. And that Sadant is what carries us, rather than looking at like these minor temporary type things. Uh, we all discuss these bills as Arctic, as economical. And if we believe that economical things are just like this part of this Maya illusion that we're existing within, then they should be minor. The Sadant and the Anak that's going to actually carry, that's carried for 300, 400 years, and it's going to carry for generations and into eternity. That is our job or our muk maksat as the Khalsa to make sure that O Sadant, they O Anka camera, the Baki the Badi Yeah, that's super powerful. Um, you know, and it's really summed up by, you know, what you're saying. 
we can be at odds with with the state but we can't be at odds with our sadant without with guru sahib because that's our entire existence the state doesn't define it um and that that kind of comes you know we wanted to kind of talk about the attitude right like um the the fear that you know people are um that kind of seems like spreading within our community um in terms of like the reaction to january the 26th you know that the nishan sahib has gone up on the lal qila and then immediately it seems that the pant became super like self conscious um of like being sick and resisting in a powerful way because we accept and everyone accepts right even the people that are kind of um against the nishan sahib going up and the ones that are you know accept the indian state's definition even they all um you know there's part of them justifying it there's a deep awareness that the indian state is a massively violent entity and and that kind of fear and and the trauma of that um state violence it, it is there within our community and and you can see it where um, you know with within the reaction um but i think you know i think you addressed uh, i think you addressed a lot of that but if there's anything that you want to say on the attitude um, and and how if whether we should let fear drive us uh, um and this i kind it kind of ties in with um, a question somebody put in the chat is um what is the cost of not resisting right and if we let our fear kind of dominate everything i think you touched on it quite powerfully but um if you if you have any comments we can move on to the next uh, question as well uh, the cost is uh, death uh, and uh, and you know what that death is meri sant ji gal karte karte se it's the same thing it's not the death of you physically necessarily it could be uh, eventually uh, we can't take that thought just because of the physical violence we've seen on behalf of the indian state in the past it could lead to physical death but that death of the conscious the jameer the mar jana the sant ji used to talk about we're just a walking shell then and not just from like a a sick perspective but very strongly from a sick perspective ke sikhi de vich oh jada manuk jada jameer mariya hoya hai tusi guru de vich ki banna hai tusi ta kisi te vi nahi ban sakde at that point that if fear is going to drive everything we do uh then definitely sikhi is alien uh, gurbani is alien uh and jinne marzi assi apne aap nu har shingar ke pesh kar liye that sikhi is alien at that point if fear is going to drive now fear is natural like as in like it comes and it goes uh and uh, gurbani and gurmat and our rani bani is supposed to prepare us for those moments and some of us are better prepared uh on this call probably than people like me but like uh the that that's what it's supposed to be there for but we understand that we can't live up to certain things right now but it doesn't mean we don't actually uh talk about them i can't do certain things that people in punjab do or maybe in the diaspora do but it doesn't mean they're wrong uh it, it just means that i'm not there yet and if i try to say they're wrong just because i'm trying to cover my own weaknesses uh that to me is a death of that conscience it's me not wanting to accept my own weaknesses and i'm trying to like block them by saying that others can go way beyond what i can do for this ngarsh way beyond putting their fears aside and resisting and engaging and giving up like their tan man and tan for any type of sangarsh they're invested in that uh, they're wrong for doing it because i can't do it and we often see that in the pant as well we see that within our six circles as well is that we start pulling people down that are out there doing way more than uh, that we can do but we're doing it in a way to kind of appease our own egos uh, or kind of like ensure that whatever fears we have and doubt we have inside of us um that that doesn't necessarily need to be checked in any which way so i would say like in a simple answer uh, the cost of not resisting is ultimately a physical death but definitely a, a conscious to kind of like uh uh zamir the marjana type death which for a sick is like uh, un, un, kind of like unfathomable um so like our post january 26th um you know what we saw happening in um, um in delhi um you know there there's been reaction obviously and repercussions around that in the diaspora as well as particularly with like social media censorship um you know uh, my twitter account was taken down as well as loads of others um what really hurt me was the khalistan center's twitter account being taken because that was like that was that account was a baby it had like a few hundred followers it wasn't like you know um in that way you know if people look at mass followership it wasn't a big deal right but you know these accounts getting taken what what do you see what 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 are your comments on that like you know um, the social media targeting especially on twitter which seems to be like you know you said the yeah uh, i think the pattern um the pattern was interesting but i think we should recognize the pattern as well the pattern wasn't too mass following the pattern was to essentially who the state thought was dangerous from a narrative perspective you look at all the names that kind of pop up 
uh, whether it's Sikh Siyasat and the groups that are in Punjab, uh, or you look at the diaspora, and a vast majority of them are linked to people like you, uh, and I guess me in, in a way, and others as well, like there's many of us that are out here, but like from NSYF to the Khalistan Center to Sikh Liberation Front to like uh, all these organizations and individuals like you that are targeted, um, you don't have like millions of followers, uh, but you have a narrative. The narrative is dangerous. You can, you can kind of have a following and there's a narrative that just kind of feeds into this idea of like people not engaging, people not engaging um, uh, like uh, from a fear or a doubt perspective, but they, they, they have a following, but they're not going to go to that degree uh, that uh, our conversations or your conversations or others on this call that might be inflicted with the same things right now, their conversations go. Uh, so I, I think I thought for me, it was a very interesting way of how India actually did this. Uh, they actually went and made the effort, or they already know because you know many of us uh, are on their list in the past as well. But they actually consciously went and looked at people and anything they were connected to. They disabled everything immediately, um, and that was different. Uh, like it wasn't just like random. It wasn't just like, hey, take anyone who's saying Khalistan or Sikh or this or that. You know, use this one word and then just like you know shut it down like we saw on instagram or we saw on facebook in the past that things that were trending were just kind of shut down but this was actually specifically focused around groups individuals and narrative uh, and they've gone to that extent now that we're just gonna like you know go but india does it and then why did these uh, you know what you know the the next piece is, is that why did these you know these social media sites and these western governments and all that what do they follow along uh what benefit is it and then the real answer to me is, is that, well, what benefit, uh, you know, like uh, from a, if you look at it from a capitalist perspective, a money-making perspective, uh, the idea of how the world works right now from an economic perspective, like India has a lot of things that they offer, uh, like from an economic perspective or, you know, like, a, and that is something that is much more valuable to governments, the, even the ones, the countries that we live in uh or settled in uh and uh that's much more benefit than anything that we can provide so you know we can fight for these things um uh, afterwards and try to get them unblocked and what they do is that in the moment they take away information so this independent ability that uh, all these people had by connecting to these sites and these people uh it was like a real raw independent way of looking at how six should be seeing these situations and how they should be reacting to them when that goes totally dark for weeks at a time during the middle of like a very crucial period that we're moving through, uh, that's problematic. Uh, Twitter is like, you know, as most people know, like uh, Twitter is like moment to moment uh, updates, moment to moment feedback, moment to moment conversations in a very clear, maybe not so clear, but very concise way in a very uh, quick way. Uh, and it's not the same as Facebook. Uh, Facebook is something, you know, long rants and like essay type writing and this and the other. People don't use it for that anymore. If people are looking for what's going on right now, and how things are moving anywhere in the world, they usually jump on Twitter and they have the people that they follow and they see what's going on for that particular topic. Having that wrenched away in this moment uh, is difficult. Um, it's not unexpected. And I, I think from a, our perspective, like as in we, we expect the Indian government to do this and much more. So it's not like we're like, oh my God, how did this happen? We expect it to happen. It's just that it still is a loss for many knowledge ones around the world that are actually engaging uh, and, and what it does to them. But I, I do want to say, like, as in, like, that, that um, this should be kind of a, a wake-up call for many people that are actually just starting to engage uh, in this conversation in the last two or three months. If you look at the, the engagement on this one issue, uh, you know, we also should be asking the question of why this Kasan Morcha uh, has drawn so much sentiment out from people. Nothing's been as big. Uh, for sure. Nothing's been as sustained and extended this long. We've seen things like with uh, Pai Parwan Singh Rajwana or uh, Professor Devinder Paul Singh Kuldar when they had their death sentences and, uh, you know, thousands of people, you know, like for a few weeks at a time would march and things like that. And then it just kind of went downhill. So it wasn't sustainable. Once you kind of uh, accomplished the mid-level goal or the initial goal of like, you know, their fancies or their hanging being kind of delayed, it's kind of like everyone went back to what they were doing. So one of the fears with this movement as well is the same thing, uh, is that when those three bills are repealed or if they're repealed, what happens then? And what happens then usually, and it doesn't matter if there's hundreds of thousands of people involved now, and back then there were tens of thousands of people involved in the other Morche, the same people are left in the same kind of like situation as when the Morche started. Everyone else goes away. 
because most of the individuals in uh, in these morche they come out when there's a situation and then they leave again uh, until the next one, uh, and they never really build up uh, enough of a resource or uh, an idea of how that perception should work. So they come and go and they engage, and that's just the reality of how everything has existed since the Guru period. Uh, we know that as well. The majority, what I'm trying to say is the majority shouldn't be the focus. The focus shouldn't be how many people do you have. The focus shouldn't be, um, you know, like, uh, does the majority agree? Uh, the majority has disagreed many times in the past, including during the Guru period. Um, and we, we know those stories of how, like, uh, like you know, they disagreed with Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji and Tir Maliyah took over the Sahib. And, you know, shots were fired as, uh, you know, and Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji was barred from even entering the Sahib. What was that? The majority, we listened to the majority there. The majority didn't take Amrit from Guru Gobind Singh. Uh, does that somehow nakade what Amrit is to a Sikh or within the Khalsa? So majority doesn't necessarily mean right. And we see that in these foreign countries as well. Uh, the majority, if you really want to know, uh, like, and, and you want to think about it this way, the majority put the people in the government in India right now that very legally and democratically within the system that they've set up for the Brahman have actually passed these bills in a very legal fashion within the, the, the content of that country. And legality is nothing but power at the end of the day. It doesn't necessarily mean like as in it works, whoever has power can actually turn anything legal. UEFA is legal, Dada was legal. Uh, the detention of like Sikh activists and Kashmiri activists for months at a time was legal. So as in like these types of things, legality ultimately just comes down to power. We can't look at it as in like uh, what's right, what's wrong, just from a form of legality. And that again comes back to perception uh, and Nazaria. Uh, the Sikh idea uh, versus the Dunyavi idea and the Dunyavi legal realm, it could be very different. Uh, and we have to choose uh, as individuals and as a fund which one we're going to align ourselves with. And based on that, future generations will judge us. Yeah, definitely. There seems to be like um, a, a disconnect between the struggle for the bills and Khalistan um, that somehow, like, you know, we know the bills are about, you know, repealing the laws. Um, and in that front, there's actually been zero progress on repealing the laws in the last two months. You know, every single meeting the unions have had with the government has come back with the government not budging or actually they have budged they've gone from not repealing the bills to saying we'll give you a year and a half before we implement the bills um narinda modi himself hasn't actually addressed uh, this struggle um uh, publicly in any way what he has actually done um, in the last like day or so um is he addressed a, a conference um um, uh, an economic conference and, and talked about the, the benefits of that these bills are going to bring. So it seems they're very committed to the trajectory. So th this disconnect between this is a struggle solely for the bills versus the, the struggle for Khalistan. Would you like to talk about that and how, um, you know, how these bills, uh, the struggle for the bills plays into this larger struggle? Yeah, the, uh, the struggle for the bills is going to eventually uh, force people to ask the question, if they're not going to budge, then what? Like, like, like the question should be on the minds of the union leaders, if they're the true leaders of the movement, because the Khalsa has a way forward, uh, traditionally and historically. So th that's not the question. The question is, what are the union leaders going to do when they don't budge? Uh, how long are they going to sit? Uh, how long are they going to engage in these Faltu discussions uh, while everything moves forward to get implemented? And what if it goes into the implement implementation phase? Then what will you do? Are you going to clash? Are you going to march straight into parliament? You got to do something. Like, what's the plan? Um, the Khalsa has a plan. Like, uh, the Khalsa's job is very straightforward as well. Like, as in, like, we'll, we'll engage in the struggle. We'll engage in a resistance. Uh, what are the what are the Kassan unions going to do? Are they going to say that we're going to block uh, grain and we're going to block rice and we're going to block produce that comes in? We're just not going to sell it. Uh, you know, how are people going to survive? Do you do you, do you have ideas around how you're going to do any of those types of things. So I, I think when you get down to those types of questions, they don't have an answer. Uh, we might say like, as in, we'll just engage in a full out struggle like we have in the past. And that's a very Khalsa sick thing to do. We'll do, we, you know, and just like the Bajorak Nahang Singh said today, that, uh, you know, if two luck of you are coming, um, uh, you know, 10 luck should come, but just make sure you bring the trolley out that, you know, your bodies will leave on afterwards. Uh, his words, but he's very clear in what's going to happen. Like, and, and that's that's one thing that the Khalsa has always been committed to is our clarity comes from the Guru and the Guru Tehas and what we can and can't engage in and when we actually engage in those types of activity. 
So uh, I, I would say that as in like, a, there's clarity on our end uh, and not so much on the Kassan Union side because uh, I think they're just hoping and wishing and praying that they repeal these three bills and it limits the Sangarsh uh, or this Morcha just for that. Um, this Morcha to me has always been a part of a bigger struggle. And I think there's a lot of us that feel this way, like as in like, you know, they can attack your Sabyachar, your Boli, your Pani, like every aspect of Punjab and Punjabiyat and Sikhi has been attacked. So all of this uh, uh, is kind of like happened before. Uh, it's happened like in, during the Tarmi of the Morcha as well. We had opportunities then as well um, uh, to kind of like engage and kind of take the state's kind of like uh, narrative and kind of just like move aside from. And we had Santiji then. And Santiji established himself as what he called the Chonky Dog. And he would take out an unprocessed resolution out of his bag and he would wave it in front of the Sangat all the time and be like, you guys gave us this. Now, if they give us something in return less than this, my job is, is not to ensure, to ensure that nobody accepts it. We come back here in front of the people and we tell you what their, uh, you know, their amendment is or what their counter offer is. And then you tell us what you want us to do. This is your fight. Meaning we're like watchmen to this, like at the end of the day, like uh, we're not the leaders, you're the leaders. That's a very different way of looking at it than the way these people are looking at it right now during this leadership run. Right? But at least during that time, what we talked about before, Anak and Sadant were camp, right? That set an example 40 years later, we're still relying on those examples in this, in this period right now. The Santiji said this, the Shaheeds did this, and that's what we live off of. Every generation lives off of the Qurbani of the previous generation to help guide us into the future. But these people that have come in, they're playing almost the longer wild card. They want this to end. They want it to end in a way that as in like will benefit uh, them to some degree, but probably the state more. Um, so uh, my my issue here is is that like if you limit this engage to just these economic reforms around these three bills, is that like you lose sight of the overall struggle for the last seven decades. To me, this is like a manifestation of second seven decades of oppression, like uh, genocide, discrimination, like violence, all of those things tied up. This is manifesting now because now it's pretty much somebody reaching into your house and pulling the roti off your table. Uh, and that impacts, yes, way more people than just Tarum alone does or Boli does. Now it's kind of gotten into that. That's why people are feeling it. But there should be no doubt that crippling uh, Punjab, this is a great way to cripple Punjab. Even if people come forward with these types of conversations that, oh, they've done it in other states as well. Oh, they're going to... What's, what's happened to those other states? We... People jokingly, and it's a very seriously disgusting thing uh, anyways, when, when people do this, uh, they, you know, they refer to people as Bayyeh, Bayyeh from like UP and Bahad. Uh, but these migrant workers that are forced out of Bahad and UP from their ancestral homes to they've lost everything, any small tota of land that they had was ripped away when these things were introduced in those two states. And they're all migrant workers in Punjab. And they make more money as migrant workers in Punjab than they do as landowners in UP and Bihar. So when this is instituted in Punjab, what do we think is going to happen? Where's Punjabi? Where are Punjabis going to go? Like, as in, like, where are you? you? Then you'll be forced out of uh, Punjab. And you're already seeing this migration happening. So what does it do in the long run? Like, if we think that the Brahman Soj is so weak that they can't understand that if they just kind of like, they weaken us in every aspect. If we start leaving Punjab ourselves and eventually it becomes a non-Sikh majority state, we have a bigger problem uh, to Punjab. Like as in like if our people are economically weakened, their boli is kind of stretched because once you leave Punjab and go to like Maharashtra or some other area, your boli starts to weaken as you're in those areas. A lot of things start happening once you leave your Tura of Punjab. So uh, to me, it's like as in like, this isn't just limited to or they came out of the blue to come up with these three bills. It's a continuation of a way to weaken Punjab to the point where that Hindu Rashtra idea won't be challenged. Punjab challenges everything. Whether it was the, you know, the citizen, Citizenship Amendment Act, Punjab has the biggest protest. Kashmir is attacked, Punjab has the biggest protest. Right? Babri Masjid or like, uh, is being replaced by Ram Mandar, Punjab has the biggest protest. All, 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 all of those things are uh, kind of reflective of what? The Indra declares an emergency. Punjab is the biggest uh, protest. Six are the big, and all in all of that, six are the biggest. The British, no question, everyone accepts biggest protest. Morche, Shahidnia, everything from Punjab, and six again, not just Punjab, six. Like as in like that point has to be made because that's the truth. So every step of the way, challenging oppression, tyranny, these types of things, 
It's always been six for the last 300 years. So I can't fathom that this Chankaya type leadership, this RSS right wing fascist type leadership doesn't see the biggest threat to their Hindu Rashtra will always remain Punjab and the Sikh majority in Punjab. So this Sangarish is not just limited to this. It's a short term uh, kind of like a repercussion here. But at the end of the day, it fits in with, with the overall struggle that Punjab has had with Delhi. Um, and when I say Delhi, I mean mainly the Hindu Rashtra in Delhi uh, and, the, and the Brahman Soch uh, from Guru Nanak's period till now, that that clash has been a much bigger clash for us. Every step of the way through the Guru period, every Guru had to deal with the Hukumat of the Mughals and the tyranny of the Brahman. The Brahman that was advising the Mughals to attack the Gurus, the Brahman that had the Gurus uh, become Shaheed, the Brahman that actually the Guru protected uh, like uh, with the Kashmiri Pandits and, and that situation. Uh, Brahmins from the Pahadi Raja were the ones that actually destroyed the entire like uh, lineage of Guru Gobind Singh at that time physically um, and when they attacked. So that Brahman has never been very far from the oppressor, whether it was the Mughal, whether it was the, uh, the, the Gora at the end of the day, and whether they themselves became that, uh, that power afterwards. So for us, it's uh, the idea that they can't even uh, think that far ahead or their farsightedness. If we start thinking of them as their farsightedness is that limited, that, that they can't see what they're doing and what the impact of what they're doing is gonna be decades from now, then we're ignorant or we're naive or like as an even worse maybe is that, uh, you know, we're just, our stupidity is somehow coming out that we still want to trust them for some reason, that India is not that bad, give them a chance. Like they made mistakes, we can still exist there. And that's the, one of the underlying problems for most people that start engaging with this struggle is this like kind of like complacency towards the state that India is my home somehow, don't disrespect the flag. And we said the exact same thing uh, and I'll end it on this like couple of points, like you know, in a couple of minutes here. But I do want to say this is that like, if you want to look at the seven decades of like uh, oppression, it's, it's very easy. Like forty-seven is a very simple thing. Punjab was divided. Hundreds of thousands of Punjabis uh, died in that. That was a Punjab. Punjab da utte utte hamla hoya. So like as in like within within months, you were a Jaram Pesha Kaum that you were declared a criminalized tribe, a criminal tribe uh, by the leadership. Uh, by 1950, the, uh, the constitution is declaring you like a Keshatari Hindu at the end of the day, your identity is being erased. By 1955, your Punjabi Suba movement's running and the state is attacking the Dwar Sahib. 200 people are killed inside the Dwar Sahib. The first time the Indian army sets foot inside the Dwar Sahib, not 1984, 1955, right? And Santaji used to say something like the, along, along the lines of that, like as in like uh, during the Punjabi Suba movement, yes, 57,000 of you go to jail. Indrajit Singh, that Indrajit Singh, like a 10, 12 year old, was killed for you raising Punjabi subas in the Wad uh, by the state. And then his body was thrown into a well afterwards. That they still broke off two thirds of Punjab, the initial Punjab, just because you wanted to speak your own language. Like Punjabi boli, wo tusi bolaniya, Punjabi sabya chart tusi camera khana. And this is the kurbani you have to give. Not necessarily just for Sikhi, but just for Punjab and Punjabi as well. And then you move forward into the 70s, you wanted the Anandpur Sahib resolution. Uh, and the Anandpur Sahib resolution was what? Decentralization of the central government's power over states. It wouldn't have just benefited Punjab, it would have benefited the entire subcontinent for that matter. And that was rejected in a way that was so violent eventually that it led to 1978 and the, uh, the Saka that happened there, the clash with state-sponsored sects that were being sponsored and brought up within Punjab. It led to 1984. It led to everything that have hundreds of thousands of people going to jail, hundreds of Shihibiyam between 1982 and 1984 especially. And it led to the Darbar Sahib Hamla and the Battle of Amritsar. And then, you know, you, the, the genocide in 1984, the 10 years of militancy and the sovereignty uh, for Khalistan uh, Sangarsh that ran and the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that were disappeared during that period. And post 1995, the violence didn't end. Post 1995, you have to see what the state did. The state started taking over your infrastructure, the SGPC, like them or hate them, there's still a structure that was within Sikh hands, was built for a specific purpose, but it should have been us if we were going to disable it. Six should have been the ones to disable it and six should have had an alternative for it. But what did the state do? They co-opted it, they took it over and now it runs 
like almost half a billion dollars worth of investment and money that the Sikh Pant gives to Gurdwari and Gurtam. And it's all in the hands of corrupt individuals. The Akali Dal was taken over by these people like the Badals, completely and literally where they're untouchable to some degree. And then you look at the Akal Taksa. The Akal Taksa became kind of like a, like a, a toy for these individuals to slap a Jathadar on, remove them. And it created confusion within the fund. And every step of the way up until 2020, this oppression has been going on for 70 plus years. This uh, interference in our affairs, this quashing of dissent. So these three bills, those individuals that are looking at it now, our Sangarsh has been running for 70 plus years. People have been engaging in Pantic circles in this Sangarsh for 70 plus years. For individuals in the last two months to come into this Sangarsh now and tell us that it's limited to just this, it's like, I think we need to have a better understanding first of how we actually engage in Sikh politics, how our perception as Sikhs and our Nazaria is guru oriented versus Duniavi and how our fears and doubts can't actually dictate the actions the Pant actually takes. So th those are just some points I wanted to bring up. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we've got loads of questions and uh, hopefully we can get through some of them, but just your last thoughts on, on this segment before we go to the questions. Um, what is the conclusion? That's what everyone wants to know, right? Like what is the route forward now? How can we resolve all these issues? I think that the way forward is uh, everyone, we've kind of just talked about it, but people know what the way forward is. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think we need to keep saying it over and over again, but we will one more time if, if, if that's what's needed. Um, our existence can't remain within like these short term goals. Baad Shahi Dawa, Raj Sankalup, uh, and Khalsa Raj, and Khalistan, these are three things that we're moving towards. Khalistan will lead to a Khalsa Raj, which will lead to the Pat Shahi Dawa. And the Pat Shahi Dawa exists within us anyways. It's one of those things that's you know really more of a, a mental kind of like aspect for us as much as it is a physical, um, that uh, you know like even in our Bagi situations, as he gave Pat Shahi. But I think like the, the way forward right now, there's two things we look at. One is the short term. In the short term with these, this specific Morcha within the lar larger Sangarsh, is that not to let our Sadant and Anak be uh, eroded in this. That is the biggest thing right now, is that anything that happens from this point forward, uh, our Sadant and Anak of the Sikh Pant and the Khalsa Pant has to remain mok, it has to remain primary. Everything else is secondary. Whether the bills get repealed, that's Badi Ghanna. But that has to remain. So every response that we give as a Pant has to be coming from like a Guru-inspired place. Uh, and that should be celebrated. Uh, and the individuals that are carrying it out they should be celebrated as well to some degree. But we're not, like I said before, narrative, soch, and action, karname in the name of that soch, uh, actions in the name of that narrative. Those are the things that we have to focus in on. Like I'm gonna give an example, like Deep Sidhu right now um, is in a very uh, weird type situation uh, with, uh, with some people, but not with those that are seeing what he's doing. He hasn't said anything or done anything that's really outside of Khal Saravat at the end of the day. Like he himself isn't a, a, you know, a physical example of what a Khalsa is, but his soch and his narrative is speaking to that. So for the time being, Deep Sidhu hasn't really done anything that anyone should be ashamed of. If anything, he's kind of just supported the Najwans on the ground to actually take out the Khalsa Yidavad that they're supposed to be and that Khalsa uh, Jajba that's supposed to coming out. He's just supporting that. So that's one thing that I think most people should focus on is that right now he's doing fine uh, in, in his role. Tomorrow he might not, and we should be able to call him out on that as well. Just like I should be called out, or you should be called out, or anyone should be called out. We, we should be open to that. There's a way to do it as well. Uh, you know, if there's a galti or a mistake that's made, also that was like the, so not being ignorant to that as well. We bandai at the end of the day, but right now he hasn't done anything uh, in that in that fashion that should really be taking away from that short term morcha. Like for me, that short term goal has to be onu camera ko the anak and the sadant. That has to be the mock. These un Kazan union leadership, if they're trying to remove or erase Sikhi from uh, the Morcha, then uh, just like people in the past have, they haven't left them, that needs to continue. And maybe Jiraya, they'll repeal these three bills, right? But if we haven't lost Anakin Sadant uh, along the way, then that's fine. If we're going to lose it and then Oprapti Huniya, then that's not okay. Then we have to Darki of the Karna Barnag, this is not okay. If they tomorrow say, uh, you take all your Nashan sides down. Like, just think of this for a second. Like, it's not going to happen, but just like, I want to mentally kind of make this point. Because when they say, take all the case three and Mila Nashan sides down, tell all the Nahang Singhs to go home, 
this is what the union said anyways, uh, remove Sikhi from everything, and then come and talk to us and we'll repeal the bills. Would we be okay with that? And that's not a question that anyone has to answer here, but you should answer it within yourself. Would we be okay with that? Like as in like Jalam de Kahete, we remove and erase the key ourselves just for that property. And if the answer is no, then why are we doing it ourselves? Well, why are we actually making that easier for them? They aren't even telling us to do those things. That we're going to give the wrong impression. That it's going to look like we're Atavadis. It's like they're not saying anything, but it's like you have to keep seeing it. They're Goldi Media. You try as hard as you want. If Ravi Singh from Khalsa A can be turned into an extremist terrorist, then Tusi Kere Baldi Mugia at the end of the day, like what's going to happen to you at the end of the day? Like, as in, like, so you will not be able to change the way they think. So stop trying. But if you're going to keep trying to change the way they think and you're going to dilute and compromise yourself and Sikhi along the way, then you're going to get called out. And that's what the Kassan Union leadership has been trying to do. Uh, and that's what others within the Sikh community and sometimes even within the Khalsa fold have been trying to do. So there is going to be that continuous clash, I feel, but we just need to be dirke of the khandi lordia. In the longer sangars, like the idea is that, you know, we don't want to be at odds with our guru uh, and their sadhans. We want to be at odds with the dunyavi kind of like tyranny and oppression that's going on and constantly be challenging that uh, in the most like raw way we can, uh, an organic way we can from like Gur Sadan. So that has to be a continuation of the Guru's morcha and the Guru's like uh, struggle that they've given uh, the Khalsa to carry out. So we have to always be on that side. We can't throw ourselves at the whim of uh, at, the, at the feet of the Jarvana at the end of, end of the day. Um, and I, I wanted to say like, what is the role of like um, the, the, the Naujwans, uh, whether it's in Punjab or whether it's here, it's accountability. You have so much power that you don't realize whether it's in your own cities and things like that, it's just that if you go to a Gurdwara and 50 or 100 of you start showing up at a Gurdwara, it's like they might be the committee, but essentially you take over the function. Like uh, between the Langar to the Darbar, uh, you would have so much power that, uh, uh, that you maybe haven't even recognized yet. But I would say like as in like reclaiming that long-term is to understand that accountability is everything. If you can hold people accountable uh, and question them, Gurdwara committees to Kassan leadership to Pantaka leadership, at some point that clash will happen. But you shouldn't be afraid of the clash. The Guru clashed with like Masans at the end of the day, even internally. The Guru clashed with their own Santan, their own offspring, their, their own children at the end of the day. So you can't be afraid of the clash. Ekta can't mean your silence. Just remember that. Ekta is never one side gets to be supreme and the other side is just silent. So don't be that silent side, nor do you need to be the supreme side. Ekta has to be a place where as in like, just like the missiles used to come together, you do vichara, you have discussions and you come up with a, uh, a compromise amongst the Pant, as in this is the way forward for now. So we have to look at it that way. And the, the Pant technology one, like there's a line at a, a Pant Prakash, Tan Khalso, Tan Pant Ka Changi, Rakhyo Beej and Sikhi Changi, Bahur Khalsa Aes Vichara, Hame Ko Daso Morcha Para. Like as in like the, you know, they're saying that tan, that tan is that Khalsa and Tan is the Najwan, that spirit and that Josh that exists within the Khalsa. Um, and then beyond that, uh, they're the ones that Akio, Beej, Jan, Jan Sikhi, Sikhi, Changi, that they're the ones that are making sure that the Beej or that seed of Sikhi is moving forward in a, in a good fashion, that they will actually, because they're the ones that will carry it forward in the next generation. But the Bazurg that are behind them have a responsibility as well, is not to hold them back not to limit their potential. It's to guide them, but to let them loose as well uh, when needed. So it's like there, there's a dual responsibility within the Khalsa there. And like even that, the, at that time, um, during the Sikh missile period, the entire Khalsa would say that Bahor Khalsa as uchara ke hame ko daso morcha para, that give them the most para morcha. Let them go and lead that mora, uh, para morcha. And the para morcha was Shabitriq when they went to the Lal Kila, and they went. But the problem there was the so-called Buddha leadership or the, the Bazurga leadership, they didn't play their role. They had every opportunity to lead them there. They had every opportunity to guide them along the way. Their own fear and doubts and their distaste or hatred of Sikhi is what kept them behind. Uh, and that's the, that's the struggle in this morcha right now is ekta to them means shut up and let us do what we're doing. But we want your bodies here physically, but just be quiet. And that's not going to happen.
Yeah, 100%. I think um, a couple of people have asked this question, but actually I, um, thinking about it now, it's, it is way beyond the scope um, of this conversation. Um, and, you know, we're, we're kind of coming up to time as well. And that is the question of um, violence versus nonviolence. I think we definitely should have a conversation, a separate conversation on that, because there's actually a lot to be said um, on, on that subject alone. Maybe in the next few days or maybe even the next week, we could have that conversation um, around violence versus nonviolence. Well, one question I'd, I'd um, definitely like to ask is um, from the Sangat is uh, one VG saying, uh, what tactics can we use to make sure this Anak stays alive within Narjuan in Punjab? And I guess that also applies to us here. And it does tie into this other question from um, someone else as well is how do, um, how do you guys feel is the correct way to capture the youth sick energy around the world beyond the protest? Why Guruji willing it succeeds? How do we get young sick men and women to look towards Sikhi and past car rallies and social media engagement? So the, the, uh, the keeping like the Anika cam, um, and Anika is a very, uh, it goes, it's, it's a word that's very loosely used, right? Because it means many different things to many different people. Like uh, my apologies for what I'm about to say here, but even those that believe in caste and like in their own caste and gold and things like that, like, we're definitely not talking about that. Uh, from a Sikh perspective, it's Gurbani and Gurbani Gurmat and Rahat is that that's where your Anak comes from. Otherwise, that so called Anak that we're talking about, that energy, that Josh and all that kind of thing. It, it's based off of a few different things, which is like anger. Uh, oftentimes, those that align themselves with movements are coming from a very strong place of anger, frustration. But that can't be Sikhandi Anak isn't. You know, our Anak comes from Piyad. Uh, at the end of the day, our Josh comes from Piyad. Our our Biradas comes from Piyad as well. It's not growth, and we, we have a term for it. We have Biradas when we talk about it. Uh, it's not anger. It's like this Ras, like as in like you know, it's it's Mitta at the end of the day, even in in that. So in that, it has to be uh, aligned to the Guru. Uh, so that, to, to do that, uh, and somebody saying, how do we keep it kind of strong, is to constantly engage uh, with the Guru, uh, is to constantly engage with Sangha. The, to, like I said at the beginning, this is, uh, well, it's very one way right now, just because me and you are talking, uh, and there's questions coming up and things like that. We can find better ways to actually engage in a more of like a discussion, maybe like 20, 30 minutes of just like laying a topic out and then opening it up to everyone. We had discussed that as well. There was just so much to talk about today that uh, we, we took this uh, kind of like a format. But like there, there's that Sangat there should keep this Anak up. Like us talking with each other brings that Anak up. And if we can check one another uh, as well, and we know what some of us do, is that when we start going down in a separate way, it's like we come forward and we stop each other, saying that as in like, like we become kind of like, you know, like uh, checks for each other uh, along the way. Uh, creating like a platform for six to engage beyond um, just uh, like uh, what were we calling it the other day? Uh, you know, Kagaj they like as in like Morche uh, or like paper revolutions um, is very difficult in, in my opinion. Like uh, it, it's, it, these things are very easy to talk about. Uh, as somebody who spent like almost two decades now kind of moving around having these conversations like from like uh, Australia to Europe to UK to US and Canada and the different Najwan circles um, it's been a very slow kind of period of about a decade or two of people to coming to terms with what they can and can't say first of all and then getting them to realize as in the countries they live in the governments they have if those are the ones that are censoring them or erasing their being or diluting or compromising them to the point where if you want to show yourself to that uh, segment of the population that you exist within in these diaspora countries, that you have to kind of lower your Sikhi, you have to water it down, dilute it, and you can and can't, can't say certain things. Um, then it's like, as in that was the first turn for a lot of people, as in like, why are we so committed to our existence as it is right now? Why are we so accepting of the fact that, you know, I'm a settler on Aboriginal lands that are unseated uh, right now? Uh, why am I okay with sitting here continuously and leeching off of their land making money, uh, you know, living within this capitalist world and not actually saying anything, but just benefiting. Um, and somebody made that comment before, like, as in like, uh, what's the cost of not resisting and not resisting or not even acknowledging where I am in the world right now and why I'm here and what my 
the impact of me existing on this land and what it does to the people where these white people came here from Europe and they stole everything from them, completely destroyed their livelihood, completely distorted their perception of who they are and how they view the world, just like they did to us. They distorted not only the perception of how we see the world, but also how we see ourselves. Uh, they othered us, they made us inferior, uh, and all of those things are still things that we're struggling with today. So all of those things get tied up into how we actually bring about our arc forward again, um, that we have to be very real with one another. We have to be very kind of like um, uh, asking questions as to like, well, why can't we say that right now? Like, why can't we use the term Khalistan in Asin Gaj? It's, is it because like India has said it's bad and the UK, Canada, United States, Australia have bought into the fact that this is extremism? Uh, rather than challenging it, we just say that just remove it and erase it. When we know it plays a very significant part in the passion and spirit it brings into the sick kind of psyche on the ground there as well. What images of some Sanjay Nal Singh do? I think it was Yusham Jair Singh that said this, uh, and I was doing uh, kind of a conversation with another group, is that uh, if we have to go back and we talk about Inkalab and who Inkalabis were, and if we have to go back a hundred years to Bhagat Singh, to find an Inkalabi that we can actually pace in front of like our, our world or the Indian world, then we are complicit in erasing that entire history where hundreds of thousands of people gave their lives for the betterment of Sikhi and Punjab at the end of the day. We don't wanna do that, but we have to ask ourselves why. Why do we actually do that? And there's a fear that the person that we're trying to explain it to won't understand. Or even if they do understand, their understanding is gonna be is that you're like an extremist. And this will go down, I'm gonna end, end on this question here. This will go down and leach down, right down to your kakas. If you can't say that your kurban is a shastra living in the West, there's a problem. If it's a symbol, if it's an article of faith, all of those types of things, those things should maybe be in museums. You don't need it on you then if it's that. If it's just that, just put a picture of it in your pocket and walk around. It's a shastra. And then if you can't engage in the conversation that it's a shastra, and that shastar is given to you by the guru, and the guru's given you instruction on when and how to use that shastar. So violence comes into this conversation at that point as well. You are shastar tari, and you are trained by guru, and you're trained by gurmat on how to use that shastar as well, and when to use it, and who to use it against. And even then, you're not using it in enmity, you're using it in love. And that love is for like humanity at the end of the day, but sikhi, because let's call it, we don't wanna get into these words, but between sikhi, and humanity and universality and all these types of words, I don't care what people use, but you've been given instructions. So that idea around when and how to use uh, violence uh, or arms or shastas, we're trained in that. We have actual like lake and licht from the guru, from Dasambani especially, on how we engage, when we engage, who we engage with. But like limiting that conversation to the fact that the Gora or the Ferangi or like the imperial or capitalistic powers of the world today, they get to decide what violence is acceptable and what is unacceptable. And the violence they use to subdue people, to marginalize them, to turn them into modern day slaves, that somehow is acceptable. But if people use the same violence to break the chains of that slavery or break that cycle of oppression, then they all of a sudden are terrorists. So uh, I won't go further into that, but that is a conversation that definitely needs to be spoken about very freely. Definitely, definitely. Um, de definitely, we need to do a, a discussion. I get getting comments in the chat as well um, on uh, you know sick violence uh, versus non-violence. Um, there's a lot of policing that's happening in our community on on how, what our resistance should look like, um, and um, that policing just makes space for the Indian state and its narratives. Whenever people talk about Khalistan um, or the mainstream conversation around, around Khalistan outside of Pantic circles, it, it it always fits back into this definition that Khalistan is bad and it's not something that you want to be associated with. Um, and then there's this whole like policing that the this struggle can only be a peaceful struggle. And if we look at every single resistance movement, the ones that you've talked about, the ones that have come from Punjab, the ones that have pushed back against colonizers, against you know um, the Mughals, against um, you know the Indian state, all of that um, struggle has taken many different forms. Um, but one of the most powerful forms of that is, has been six taking up armed resistance, taking up arms against colonizers, taking up arms against the Indian state, and that is um, a raise to the point of being nonsensical. And that itself is, is a massive just injustice. There's a lot being written about it. And 
Um, but just to suffice to say is that conversation, it protects and shelters the state. It actually doesn't protect your people. And if anyone's protecting people right now, we can see at, at Shambhu, it's literally right in front of you. It's the Nahang Jate Bandiya. If it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for them being Shastatari, them bringing horses, this um, Morcha would have had a, a, a very different um, dimension to it. And there would have been more violence from the state. I mean, that's that much is clear, but it is definitely a conversation we need to go into. I think we'll take one or two more questions and um, and hopefully try to wrap up. Let me make a, a comment, right? Like, uh, just, just, uh, just, uh, just within that kind of sense, then yeah, definitely the, whatever questions we have. Um, I was doing a, a like a, um, I was doing a convers having a conversation last week with um, uh, younger students, high school students, and uh, I brought up like ideas for them, like as in like uh, look at Palestine, look at Kashmir, look at the Tamils in Sri Lanka, look at all these movements around the world that are political in nature. Some of them are religious in nature. Uh, some of them are like, uh, but they all have every means open to them. Like even the Irish, uh, the IRA, and like, what's happening, what happened in Ireland. Uh, what the Pan-African movements and like even Mandela and all of them, like everything started and had a piece of armed resistance as an option. So you don't remove it as an option. When you engage with it is ultimately from a Sikh perspective is based on what I said before, is based on what the Guru has said, that we have been taught how, when and how to engage and with who to engage. But I do want to say one thing, oftentimes that engagement, the engagement is limited to individuals, right? So when we see, when we think bad, and this is a conversation that's happening in our, in our community right now as well. We're fighting the government, not the country. What the hell does that mean? Like Modi's bad, but not the country. Well, Modi was bad. Like Indra was bad. Like as in like, but like it all, it, it's like, so we're supposed to kind of uh, almost like remove the individual from what the state actually represents. But there's, there's a quote that I used uh, in that, uh, and I just want to kind of read it out. I just pulled it up. Uh, and it's by uh, Stokely Carmichael um, Kwame Ture, uh, also known as Kwame Ture, uh, like a black uh, black power leader. Like he was one of the first individuals to term uh, black power and that black power movement within the United States. Uh, and he had something that was against nonviolence. And it wasn't even against it. It was just kind of like showing, like as in like, well, you think you can be nonviolent and exist. Right? And he termed and used Dr. King as an example. And his, the quote was, Dr. King's policy was that nonviolence would achieve the gains for black people in the United States. His major assumption was that if you are nonviolent, if you suffer, your opponent will see your suffering and we move to change his heart. That's very good. He only made one fallacious assumption. In order for nonviolence to work, your opponent must have a conscience. The United States has none. He didn't say like a particular US president. It's not Trump, it's not Biden, it's not Obama, it's not Bush, it's the United States. The mechanism of oppression exists within the state and its machinery and how it was founded and how actually it deals with these types of situations where any type of uh, thing outside of nationalism and Rashtarwad is attacked in a way where you are other, violence is acceptable by the majority of people, whether they're white or they're Hindu. And this is, I'm just saying the term Hindu now because when violence is used against Kashmir, violence is used against Dalits, violence is used against Sikhs, violence is used against any other minority, the vast majority of people that exist within the power structure of India are not only silent and complicit, they're very vocal in protecting the nationalistic interests of the state in that period. So limiting kind of like the idea of violence the state uses to the individuals in that moment of time using it, whether it's Indra, whether it's Modi, it's limiting the actual conversation. It's the state, the state machinery, and that soch, like that Brahmanavadic, Hindutva, RSS, uh, right-wing fascist type soch that has existed within India for thousands of years, that source just has a place of power now with Modi and it's being exemplified, but the Congress has been no better in their dealing with these types of issues as well. So that just takes you back to, it's the state that you're fighting against. It's a state source. It's not an individual. Individuals come and go, nothing changes. That just should lead that the monopoly on power is still what's actually running the state. 100%. Um, I kind of want to end it on one question. I, I wish I could take every single question, but um, you know, time doesn't allow us. Um, but this one question I think is um, is super interesting. Um, as six living outside of India, how can we continue to push, promote, encourage, um, uh, encourage unity to drown drown out the noise from union leaders or those that are creating a rift, other than just social media? Or is that the best way? 
a dr drowning them out is uh, ultimately impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen that up until now in the last two months. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried to drown them out. Uh, we tried to give them every opportunity to establish themselves. The fake nara of Ekta has been doing that, uh, has it not? Like for most people, if you think about it, Ekta has always been like, as in like, Deep Siddhu, Lakasadana. These are the guys on the ground, not us out here, but even us out here. Pantak Jatibandia, like guys like, uh, I'll say, like Bhai Mantir Singh or just Paul Singh Mansford or Dr. Sevak Singh or these very Sujwan, very educated, but very, very Pantak Soch Gursiks uh, have been saying the same thing, like as in like, uh, we, we don't agree, but like, like we're going to keep talking our talk uh, and we've been trying to drown them out or let them continue. Now the problem is, is that we see that it's not going to work. They, they've gone on the attack mode now. Uh, like trying to drown them out is an impossibility at this stage. Um, it's almost like, you know, like uh, the fear is what if we open up our own front and everything splits, right? That's the fear. Ultimately, most people, they want to drown them out uh, and not engage them like head on because morcha tutuha. But ultimately, the question is if the morcha is going to continue to attack Sikhi, Sikh, and uh, Sikh Sadant, then should they not be taken on head on? What's, what's bigger in the long run? Is it the prapti of the three bills being repealed? Or is it to keep your sadant or anaka camp? And only you as an individual can answer that question of what is more important to you. Like trying to say that as in like there's actual leadership there, people can come forward, um, but like out here in the West, uh, we're clashing with one another. Uh, we're clashing in our various cities across the world. People that are involved with the Kassan unions, those that are involved more from Pantic circles, uh, we're clashing with one another as well because they uh, blindly are following the Kassan leadership because that organizational structure is set up in that way. They don't question what the leadership is saying. We, on the other hand, and this is like funny to me in a way because we're the so-called extremists. We're the ones that actually, we're the ones that are questioning not only them, but even ourselves as well and our own so-called leadership there. Uh, and it's open. We do marches uh, and we tell people, you know, bring whatever chanda you want, bring whatever, you know, we don't stop anyone. We're not censoring or erasing anything right now. But when others are putting posters out, and you've seen this, Kassan leaderships across the world, uh, whether it's them in Punjab, and they've said it, no Khalistan, no Kesari Nishan Sahib, no this, no this, keep it about the, this. They specifically put on their posters, but blindly what those people from there are telling them. We hear from among, amongst Pantak circles, are like just anyone and everyone come. We understand Punjab's politics and people are diverse. We are going to say what we're going to say unapologetically. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem for you. We're not stopping you from engaging in your own politics and your own expression and your, you know, your own bold ballet at the end of the day. We may not agree with it, but we're not gonna stop you. We're not gonna do the work of the state right now, but they are either deliberately or in ignorance doing the work of the state uh, out here. So I would say like, it's very difficult to drown them out. You can sign it, and if you, if you think drowning them out, the only way to drown them out is to set up your own front. Then essentially what we're leading to is clash uh, as well. Uh, and that it's, it's, since the 26 especially seems to be a bit accelerated at the moment. Uh, and many people are fearful of what it will do for the Morcha. Um, and ultimately that, that idea of what the Morcha actually is representing, like we talked about this entire like hour and a half or so, is that first that needs to be clear in your mind. If you're out there to protect Sikhi, Sikh Sadant, and uh, the Anak and Jeevani of like how we exist, uh, then it'll be very clear that we can engage in however the Guru's instructed, even with these individuals. But if you're out there to get the bills repealed, then likely you're gonna be one of those individuals that continues the false cry of Ekta, where you get to talk and I have to shut up. Yeah, definitely. And I think the, the diaspora has actually been playing a role in, in upholding the the hierarchy of the, the unions, because a lot of the commentary I've seen, and like you're saying, from people that have just come into um, this space of protesting, of resisting, um, you know, they've been pushing this narrative that the Kassan union leaders are the official voice, and they are the ones that have to be listened to. And again, you know, like there's been a few a few questions about leadership, about Sikh Pantic leadership versus the union leadership. Um, just on that, like I think a lot of people don't understand that the Kassan unions uh, they have a lot of resources, they have a lot of space to operate and function. They have a, a big cadre of people that they can draw from. They're organized in villages um, because they have that space. And the issue that we're seeing with Pantic leadership 
and which is completely discounted in people's conversation is Bantic leadership doesn't have any space to organize or take a central role. And, you know, the thing is, if Bantic leadership did take a central role, it wouldn't be a hierarchical top down model because that's not the way Sikhi teaches us how to organize. It would be decentral. It, the, the Sangat would be giving, um, taking the leadership. And we can see that from Sant Janelle saying, and like, uh, you know, the speeches Santji made to the Sangat. Um, uh, and and talking uh, uh, talking with the sangat about uh, like you need to understand your responsibilities and what their role is as the peredar. Um, so that is a, a really important part of the conversation that I think we all need to kind of uh, make space for and, and and push more that you know the Pantic leadership doesn't have the space to organize freely uh, and when Pantic leadership does organize they're comp they're always targeted by the state first and you know like we don't even have any social media accounts now roughly yeah <laughs> so it, it becomes very very difficult to create space and then on the other hand we have official social media accounts with massive following that you know have huge platforms so I think we need to um, I think with, with the COVID thing as well it's really you know kind of upset a lot of dynamics um, because if we were organizing good in Gordware, if we were organizing, you know, on the streets, then those dynamics could kind of come into play a bit more. But in this world of kind of social media with official voices and official letterheads and all that kind of stuff, it just people are amplifying, um, you know, th those messages um, without without any kind of critical reflection. You know, it's just a lot of regurgitation of of messaging. The 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 often it's like uh, how do we get the you know we were saying before like uh, the uh, I'll, 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 I won't take too much time here but like the majority we have to get out of our minds that um, like the majority is actually going to do something and we need to get the majority on our side for something it's like that, that that's a a very dangerous kind of uh, kind of like a road when you start walking down it because that often leads to compromise uh, on many at many stages um, and we can't compromise on like Gursadant at the end of the day, you know, and we view and perceive Gursadant in a very different ways as well, but those are opportunities for a and discussion. But the bottom line there is, is that like, uh, if we're waiting for like, as in like, uh, getting more and more people on our side and how do we kind of like make sure that people out there are understanding our, our, our ideas is that we won't be able to do that in a month. Or two months, or three months. It's not like a thought. It's like a, it's a cycle. It's something that's continuous and forever. Is that we continue to talk, we continue to take up space. We're in Gordoras. We're on like online, whatever form of conversation that we can engage in. That there's got to be people that are engaging in those conversations. And we saw that like in Vancouver, like people have been circulating a, a video of uh, you know, he's a good friend of mine here, um, and you know, like uh, you know, he's he's definitely not in Kalsa Roop or anything. But, you know, he was made a very powerful, like, you know, small, short speech around, like, why Khalistan can't be removed from the conversation. And by removing it ourselves, we're doing a disservice to, to the fund. Um, and uh, that was very powerful for people because, you know, this individual deals in a lot of, like, sabiyacharic circles, pangra circles, arts, and things like that. And the vast majority of those people have always been aligned to the left uh, in Punjab and like, uh, the, the communist type, uh, of kind of leadership that's there. That's always been anti sikh So when he came out and said that, um, he received backlash from a lot of people that, you know, deal with them, but he received praise from like way more people, even those amongst the circles, because those people, when they see people like me, they may not engage with me because they've already got a perception of the type of individual I am and what type of so-called propaganda I'm going to spew. They don't expect it to come from Motariwa. And those are the people that are on the call is that like those conversations happening in smaller places amongst 10, 15 people, 20 people in our families is that like, you know, just saying why, you know, somebody jokingly says something about Khalistan or Sanjay Nau Singh, and we have a different idea. Oftentimes to preserve the peace, people go quiet. This happens in Pantak Siyasat and it happens right down to our home level. Ideas and people don't change because we ourselves don't engage or we remove ourselves from any type of um, opportunity to engage because we fear what the result might be. We fear what it might, might do to our relationships. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves is that if we're being respectful uh, in a sense from the, the guys and like, we just want to understand, like I do this all the time with my family and some of them like, you know, start beaking off at me and I'll keep my sahaj and calmness and I'll just kind of ask them a question. Like, well, why are you getting all angry? Like I should be the one getting angry, shouldn't I? I'm the Khalistani extremist, so I should be the one that's getting all angry. I'm just asking you, where did that come from? Let's talk about that. 
So it's like the more this conversation moves into circles everywhere, small circles, the more normal it becomes. We're not trying to uh, convince or convert people all the time. We're trying to have a very open such a conversation. And in that, I think a lot of people get triggered. Uh, some people get triggered in a very angry way. And some people get triggered in a very like thoughtful way, like as in like, I need to learn more about this. And I think I hope that these conversations that we're having, like in all these different circles, that that's what it's doing. It's raising this curiosity that like it or not, um, you can't run from it. Somehow this entire Sangharsh, if you're born into a Sikh Prabhat, is tied to you in some way. And if you want to engage with it, my only bainti is to engage with it in a very raw way, in a very organic way, in a very Sikhi way, and to leave all of your prejudices and propaganda you've heard at the door as you start engaging. Yeah, thank you so much, Riji, and, and thank you everyone for um, coming through, and, and thank you everyone who's been watching on the, the Facebook Live. Um, hopefully we can continue this conversation and really hone in on, on, on that topic that a lot of you were asking about in the Q&A about nonviolent resistance versus, um, you know, uh, taking up arms, etc. So, Tanwar Tawadda, Sarayanda Viji, Tanwar Tawadda, Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh.